Today we're going to be talking about uh, how to prepare for an auction, um, especially to producers or, or to people who haven't been to one before, and, and in particular livestock auctions. Uh, there's a lot of special things that go on there that you don't see at other auctions. Maybe you've been to a charity auction or a real estate auction, uh, but a livestock auction is going to be a lot different. We're going to talk about a lot of the things that you need to know before the auction, during the auction, and after the auction. And this is for new producers and experienced producers. So there's information in these videos that uh, could be for anyone that is going to be doing this type of, or going to this type of sale. If you have located a sale that you would like to go and potentially buy an animal from, you need to catalog and information before you get there. One of the easiest things that you can do is just simply pick up the phone and call that prospective breeder and I asked for it. In today's time, a lot of our catalogs are actually published on the internet, and so you can go uh, just simply to a Google search and type in the breeder's name or the farm name or whatever, and odds are you'll be able to find an online version of that catalog. Once you get that catalog, you don't need to bypass the first two pages. The first two or three pages in every catalog is full of information that you may need. One, it has the actual location, so if it's a farm that you don't know where it is, their GPS address will be published, the name of the auctioneer, the name of the ringman, and all their phone numbers will be published. There will be information in there about who is doing trucking if you don't own your own trailer, or maybe it's a sale out of state that you would like to, like to participate in. There will be information there on who can actually haul your purchases to you, so there will be times. Uh, listed there on when the cattle are available to view, when the sale will actually happen. All that information will be here. There will be hotel accommodations in the, in the sale catalog as well. The main thing I want you to think about though are those phone numbers. So if you're looking to purchase an animal absentee, if you're not a, um, in a place to where you can go to a sale, all those phone numbers for those ringmen and those auctioneers will be published and you can call one of those and they can evaluate those livestock for you in person while they're there and call and kind of be somewhat of a consultant to you. There is also usually a list of consultants that will be at each sale doing those very practices as well. So those are great purchase uh, options for you in the front side of the catalog. Also, if that sale is to be simulcast online, all the information that you need to get an online bidder number or watch the sale online will be in those first couple pages of that catalog. So be sure uh, not to skip through the first couple of pages. Understand all the information, the sale terms will be there, as well as insurance and trucking like we talked about before. All those things are, are needed pieces of information before you make your purchase. All right, Evan, so you talked about what was in the catalog and how to uh, find who to look for and, and who to go to as far as questions, but let's talk about the actual bulls that are in the catalog and making those selections. So can you give us a little bit of an idea of how to do that? It's a great practice to set a budget. You know, know um, how many dollars our enterprise can expend on a bull to start with. And then the next question is, is what's our goals, right? Um, do we need a bull to breed heifers to? Do we need a bull to breed mature cows to? Are we going to keep heifers back? Uh, do we sell everything in our feeder calf operation? Uh, all those considerations and, and your county extension agent can help you through that, but we need those items, those goals, before we can really start looking at an EPD profile and determine which bulls in the catalog actually meet our criteria. And so I think it's great if we've determined those goals to go through the catalog and literally take a marker, and if we know bulls do not meet our goals, you know, I put a big X through mine. I don't want to, because here's what will happen is I'll go to a sale and one of the ones that doesn't meet my goal will look fantastic, and I'll fall in love with them. And, the, and all of a sudden I have like this inner struggle with myself, right, on what to buy and how to buy. And so I make sure I take those bulls that, genetically do not meet my goals out of consideration to start. And then I start kind of highlighting the good points and bad points about each of them. Mm -hmm. And using those EPDs, all of a sudden we can start figuring out the bulls in the sale that are the best value to meet my goals. 
Um, and so, like we talked about working with your county extension agent on those EPDs, if you don't have a good understanding of them, uh, that's a great place to start. Yes, and so with that, just a short, you know, a short example of an EPD that would be in the catalog, they're not going to show the entire EPD, but they may have highlights on there. So what are the things that you would look for? If a catalog does not have a full EPD profile listed, and, and a lot of them do now, a uh, matter of fact, a lot of them will flood you with information that you don't really need. Um, but if they don't have the actual EPDs that you're looking for, the one thing that they do have is the registration number on every one of them. And that allows you to go back in, let's just say if we're buying an Angus bull today, uh, we can go to the American Angus Association and we can punch that registration number in and it'll give us up-to-date EPDs. EPDs are constantly changing now in the, in the world of technology. They're updating like weekly. And so this gives you an opportunity. Maybe the EPDs in the catalog, uh, maybe they were published a month ago. And we want, some, we want to double check and make sure everything is still the same. We can go to the website, pull up that particular breed, and, um, and punch their registration number in and make sure the EPDs are correct. Or find the ones that aren't published. So, for example, if you can't go to a sale and you're only looking based on the catalog, what are some things to consider? So, I would look, we talked about using your catalog, right, the information in the front. I would look through there, and if there was a name that looked familiar to me, or if I knew somebody that was listed in front of the catalog, I would call them. And I would say, while you're at the sale, um, I need you to evaluate these lot numbers for me. Give me your opinion, let me understand. And then call the breeder too, and say, look, this is my goal for my feeder calf operation or my cow calf herd, whatever the case may be. And say, these are the bulls that kind of interested me in your catalog. What's your opinion of each of these? And hopefully they'll give you an honest answer. Uh, but I, still even today, knowing breeders and, and, and trusting them and their opinions, um, I still always like a, thir a third set of eyes on cattle, especially when we're making a significant purchase, right? Uh, and a lot of these bulls cost quite a bit of money anymore. So it's not a, the breeder will not be offended for you calling one of the ringmen or one of the consultants too and having them go and look and evaluate cattle for you. Um, the main thing that you need to do for that is call early, right? You don't need to call them like 10 minutes before the sale and say, hey, I need you to go look at X, Y, and Z. Tell me, tell me what you think. Call them a day ahead of time. Give them a game plan saying, look, this is what I want to do. Uh, this is what I'm looking to spend. You tell me your opinions when you get there. Right. It's important to have that. It's important to have that sort of relationship and build that Absolutely. in case you were to go back to that producer or to that uh, that seed stock grower. They would know, you know, that you, what you're looking for and give you an idea. Or if you want to bid yourself and it's broadcast online, they can still evaluate those cattle for you that, or the sheep or whatever the, whatever you're buying at the time. Um, give you their opinions and that'll allow you to be better online, right? You'll have better information to where you can bid on your own um, on an online broadcast. All right, so the next thing that I feel like is an important consideration pre-sale would be what does the producer that is putting the sale on require as far as funding? So do they need, require check, cash? Uh, does your bank need a let? Do you need a letter from your bank? What are those things that would maybe be considered for the sale? So that information uh, should be published in the front two or three pages of the catalog. Um, some producers, let's just say, uh, if I'm a producer and you're a buyer from three states away and you and I don't know one another, sure. I may require some form of a bank reference for you. If you plan to come and purchase large amounts of cattle or spend a large amount of dollars, uh, because a lot of times those cattle will leave their premise before the checks cash, right? And so I may want some type of financial reassurance from your bank saying, yes, this individual does have that. Um, most of the time cash, check, um, are the terms of sale. Uh, some of our smaller livestock sales will actually take a credit card or a debit card, uh, but they will publish in our catalog. Most always there will be a fee associated with swiping a card. Um, so keep that in mind. You're probably going to pay three to four percent above what your bid price was just in payment fees at the end of the day. So if that's a budget consideration, right. you need to make that known in your pre-sale considerations. Yep. But I would, that's one of those things like we talked about calling the breeder prior to, that's a great question to ask them. Say, look, you don't know me, 
-hmm. I'm from a long ways away. What do you need to feel comfortable with me coming to your cell and buying? Absolutely. And, and most banks will gladly write you a letter. And when you go to get your buyer number, wherever that's situated in the cell ring, you can handle them that letter and they'll be the person to handle that for you. So we've looked at our catalog and we've talked about some of these considerations, but now we have to get the animal home if we purchase it. So how, what considerations do we talk about as far as transportation and what do you as the, as the buyer need to get ready for? I think one of the things to note, um, most of the consultants and the ringmen and uh, auctioneers that are, that are doing these sales, it's, it's really a small network of guys that you see time and again doing these sales, but they have a good understanding of who is competent, uh, who is cost effective as far as truckers go, who's available. Um, I know for myself, um, regardless of where I'm buying cattle from, I have one guy that I want to haul them for me. I don't trust anybody else, right? Uh, if someone buys a bull to sell and they ask us who to truck, I'm gonna give them his name. Um, now, if it's a sale that's out west, for example, and we're in Kentucky, I may call him before the sale a week or two and say, hey, are you going to be in this area anytime soon? And he may say yes or no. And so if he says yes, you know, that kind of gives me the green light. I've got a trucker there that's pretty competent that I trust. Um, but all those sale consultants, I promise you, they've all got somebody in their pocket that they, that they trust, that they would let haul their own cattle, that they know is affordable. Uh, that that can be a service to you. So they'll tell you trucking is is not a big concern. For me personally, it still is. Like after I make a sizable purchase, whatever it is, I want to make sure it's kept safe and hauled correctly home. Uh, and so I would use those consultants as a as a relationship to those. Sometimes um, there are some larger firms that haul livestock across the country, and their names and numbers will be published in that catalog. And those guys have a great reputation, and so you can use those as well. And there's nothing wrong with taking your own truck and trailer to the to the sales. In fact, in, in a lot of the sales in our state, particularly, there are you're going to see people calling, you know, across the state and in their own personal trucks and trailers. And so, just be mindful of that, and and know that when you are going to be hauling your animals, that you arrive early so that you find a spot. And and some of those uh, things that you may not think about because you're excited about the sale. Absolutely. And there, so there's a couple considerations that you need to think about if you're going to haul your own purchases, especially across state lines. If you haul cattle within the state or sheep within the state, we do not need a health certificate to go with them. Right. If you cross state lines, you need to make sure when you check out that night and you write your check that they give you appropriate paperwork for your cattle or sheep or whatever to, to grow across state lines. So that way, uh, if for some reason you have an issue or you're stopped, um, you have documentation of those cattle's health and well-being from their state of origin uh, to get you legally across state lines. That's right. It, we would hate to have a purchase and not be able to right. get home with it. And I think, you know, one of the things that we see a lot of times, there's actually an incentive to bring your trailer to a lot of sales. Uh, one of those is you might get to haul something for somebody else and help with your fuel mileage, right? Yes. But the second thing is a lot of bull sales now are actually giving a day of credit back off of your purchase, whether it be 50 or 100 bucks, whatever it may be. If you take your purchases home that day, they don't have to feed them, they don't have to move them. Uh, they'll knock 50 or 100 bucks off your bill sometimes, and it'll be published in the catalog if they do that. Um, so maybe it saves you a little bit of money. Yep. All right, Evan, so let's talk a little bit about the day of the sale and the, um, and the kind of the schedule and, and how we'll work that. So when we arrive to an auction, how early should, should we be like uh, two hours early, 15 minutes early? When should we be getting there to, to these sales? I would tell you, if I was going to make a, a purchase of a bull that's going to be a genetic um, contributor for several years in my herd, I would have been there a week ago and actually saw the cattle like before they moved them to the sale facility, checking dispositions, those type things. Um, I still think, and most breeders would allow this, right? Um, they would want you to come and see the cattle uh, before they get them all dolled up, before they get them in pens. Um, they have no problem with that. And so I would tell you, go a week early to start, kind of sort through, 
get some get some ideas of some cattle that you like. And then sale day, um, if I've got if I've got several cattle that we're considering um, or they're on my short list, I think I would want to be there probably two hours before the sale. Um, there's no point in rushing through those decisions whatsoever, especially if it's going to be a bull that you want to keep for three to five years going forward or, or have plans to do so. Uh, we don't, I see no reason in trying to make a hasty decision just because we showed up late, you know. And we see that happen a lot. We see a lot of people walk in, grab a plate of food, sit on the bleachers like five seconds before the sale and buy a bull that's going to contribute. And maybe he meets their goals, maybe he doesn't, you know. I think this really needs to be a calculated and educated decision um, as you go through the process and, and make sure we keep our eyes on the goal. So there's a few other things that you have to do when you when you get there as well. You mentioned grabbing a plate of food, which I know is at a lot of auctions, but um, like bidding sheets, you know, what what what's that process when you get there is like, where you get your bidding sheets, is there a certain place that you go to? How does that work? So there will be a table or an office or somewhere at every sale, and that's where you will go to register for your buyer number. On that table uh, will be catalogs if for some reason you don't have yours. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a sell order, so it'll tell what order the cattle will actually come in the ring. If there's any updates or corrections to the sale catalog since it's been published, there will be a sheet of those there to you. And so all the extra information that you need to kind of plan how your tactics, per se, of the auction will be there on that table. So the one thing that you will need, we talked about earlier, if they require a bank letter, that's where you'll turn that in. Odds are you're going to need to show them your driver's license too to mm -hmm. get a registered bidder number. It, now, how often is it that there's changes? Like, could there be like animals that are not going to be for sale anymore, or could there be updates? Like, it, would that be something else to look? For Absolutely. To for um, there's always going to be outs, out lots. So animals that were in the catalog that for some reason aren't their sale day. Uh, maybe they were injured, maybe they got sick, whatever, the breeder doesn't want to put them in. And so they will, there will always be, and this will be on the supplement sheet that we talked about, there will always be those animals at every sale. I've never been to one that there's not. Uh, if you're looking at buying females, maybe there was a change in breeding information or breeding dates, or maybe the sires that were supposedly mated to those cows, maybe there was something incorrect in the catalog, that'll be listed there. Uh, if if you're looking at bred cows, maybe one of them calved between the time the catalog was published and sale day. So that information will be there too. Right, which is another good reason to get there early yeah. that way, because most, maybe that animal was one that you had right. circled that you really wanted, and now you really need to do some quick research and, and look at it's that. always It's always been my experience that the lots that I'm usually interested in, there's something about them on the supplement sheet. I mean, just about every time, that's just my luck, but but there's a, uh, maybe it's a, uh, it's one of those things to me that you really just need to, like I said, take your time and study that supplement sheet just like your catalog and make sure that you understand everything that's changed. Make sure that animal still meets your goal and what you need, you know. All right, so we've gotten there a little early and, and we're looking at, you know, some of the animals that we had selected in our guide and maybe they just you know, what, what do we do if they don't really look like what we thought they would? You know, maybe they, you, we look at them and, and uh, you know, there's something that we're seeing about them that just doesn't, doesn't look right. So I guess it's kind of a, a loaded two-part question. You know, what things should we be looking at when we do look at them? And uh, what do we do when they don't look like we thought they were going to? So the first consideration, one, we've already evaluated their genetics, right, by their EPD profile, whether we did it on our own or with the help of someone along the way or extension, whatever the case may be. So we've already got a short list of cattle, per se, in the catalog that meet our goals, right? right. So when we get there, um, <clears throat> this is why I think it's important to go a week before this, and, and see them out in the field or in a larger pen or a larger space so that we can evaluate feet and legs, make sure, make sure the structural components of the calf are correct uh, and confirmation is correct in the cattle. Uh, disposition is a big thing. Um, make sure that they're not crazy, right? Um, so those are things that I, that I think are more well represented 
prior to sale day than maybe what they are on sale day. Um, a lot of sales, especially out west where they have a lot of weather, we'll see those cattle bedded in straw really deep. And so those, when, when cattle are belly deep in straw, we really can't evaluate feet and legs very well. It's one of those things that really, you've got to get in the pen, you've got to really take time and evaluate them. Um, and if, if you don't have an eye for that, there will be somebody there that can help you. Uh, we go back to those consultants and those ring men and all, odds are those guys can help you through that process too. Um, so I think that's really appropriate to get in there. We talked about there getting early to be able to take time and make all of those evaluations on foot. Um, I think it's extremely important. All right, so, so we've, uh, you know, we, we've arrived early, we've evaluated the animals, we've looked um, and to see if they fit you know, and, and follow up with what we saw in the book to some, an animal that we want, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what's next? We're, we're getting ready to, to sell things. So I guess we have to find a place to, to sit. Like what, what, what's the next part? And, and when finding that, like finding that place to sit, finding out where that auction is, like where do we go? Like what's the best? So there'll be an obvious sell ring, right? Um, with bleachers and everything or chairs for people to sit. Um, I think it's really appropriate at that point to sit down with your catalog to start with. Find, first of all, you talked about finding the spot. Front middle. You know, that's where the best students are, right? Yeah. Um, sometimes that's where the best bidders are too. Now, you want to be somewhere to where you can see your ring man mm -hmm. uh, that's working your section. You want to be able to see the auctioneer. You want to be able to see the cattle come in and how they react, right? Um, you also want to be in a place to where you can be conspicuous because when it comes time to bid, you want to be able to be seen to do that. Um, so I would find to me, center of the bleachers or edge of the bleachers and halfway up is like the best because you're in the line side of the ring man at that point and they can see you. It's hard sometimes when someone is literally at your feet, maybe they're trying to bid somewhat inconspicuously and you miss them. You want your bid in early, as early as possible because the worst case scenario is is two people bid at the same time Auctioneer gets to call one in and the next one has to bid more money to get back in the sale. So find a, a good spot um, and sit down with your catalog and your supplement sheet and your sale order and make sure that you've got your game plan in mind. And that's like we've talked about, that sale order will tell you who's coming in first and where, which animals that, that you like, where they're going to be in the sale order. Uh, so it'll help you get a better understanding of when you're going to bid next. Uh, and it'll help you kind of prepare uh, and make sure that you're in the appropriate spot when it comes time for your animal to come in the ring. How, how do I know who the ring man is? So you think of, think of a ring man as your go-between between between the auctioneer and yourself, right? Uh, it is his job to represent your bid to the auctioneer in a timely fashion. It is his job to let you know that when someone else is bid, like in the, in the chaos of an auction, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. you know, you might not know that that your bid isn't leading now. And so it's his job to go back and say, it's your turn to bid. This is how many dollars there are on the table. You know, this is what the auctioneer's asking for. And so <clears throat> that's their job. And, and the thing to keep in mind, uh, this is happening at a very brisk pace, okay? Uh, and so that ring man may be working with three or four bidders in their section at a time. So it's their job to kind of keep up with everybody uh, but make sure that it, when it's your turn to bid, if you still want to purchase that animal at that price, they give you a quick opportunity to do that. Uh, but basically, we're going to sell an animal through a lot of these sales every 45 seconds to a minute and a half. There's not a lot of time spent once the auction actually starts. Um, so it's their job to make sure that you're aware of what's going on. How do I get their attention? Do, do I do a head nod, do I jump up and wave my hand? Do I do, you know, do I shoot guns at them every time? And I, like, what, what, what's, the, what's the protocol for that? What's, what's your recommendation for how to, so, how to make those bids? So I would tell you this. Um, first of all, if someone would like to purchase something in the sale, but doesn't want to make a big deal about it, okay? Or maybe they, they would like to do so with not many people knowing, 
and that's perfectly fine. Um, if they could go to the ring man before and say, hey, look, I'm interested in this lot. I'm gonna be standing here, you know, and I may be bidding. Let's just kind of, let's don't make a big deal about it. Uh, that ring man, those auctioneers, whatnot, they respect those decisions. And so they will gladly help with that. Um, but to me, uh, if you're sitting in the stands and you and I haven't had that discussion before, simply raising your bidder number and then putting it back down, okay, uh, is the easiest way to do that to me. Uh, a lot of those cards are on white cards that are easily seen. Um, I would encourage you not to use it as a fan, <laughs> right. okay? Um, because you got to think an auctioneer, or excuse me, a ring man might be looking at 50 to 100 people in their section, right? And he's looking for someone to raise their hand or hold their card or whatever. And if everybody's doing this, it's distracting. Yeah. And he may miss he may miss bids, or he may call a bid that's that he thought was bidding that actually weren't. So to me, <clears throat> being very blunt uh, about it is a great idea. Raise your hand, raise your card, whatever. Once you've established that first point that I'm gonna bid on this animal, here's my card, then he might look at you and you can nod your head. And that's fine, or raise your hand again, whatever the case. Um, but if you're in a crowd of 50 or 100 people and you're trying to wink, like from the back row, I may not see you, or whoever else is working the sale may not. Um, so be very careful about that. I, once you bid the first time, that ring man will know to come back. That's what they're trained to do. Is that kind of becoming more of an emotional thing than an actual like thought out business <laughs> decision? I, I've noticed that at auctions before. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we see emotionally based decisions a lot of times at sales. And uh, that's where it comes back. You know, we talked with Whitney earlier about Xing out the ones in our catalog that we don't want, mm -hmm. uh, ranking the ones in our catalogs to, to meet our goals. Hopefully, that that takes some of the emotion out of our decisions, because an auction is fun. I mean, it's exciting. Uh, it makes you want to be a part of it, and um, so keeping our eye on the prize and, and obtaining those goals is is really important. Um, and and having those decisions made before you sit down. Uh, and I guess really also important. too, like making sure that if, if anybody else is there with you, that you're on the same page, like right. maybe if you had a part business partner or a spouse, um, you know, making sure that you're both on the same page of what's going on there. Right. Um, we see that a lot in, in the midst of a sale. You'll see a discussion between maybe two business partners or a husband and wife or whatever about do they continue to bid or do they not? Those things really, they really need to be thought out before you get there. You know, I'm not gonna spend one penny more than X number of dollars, whatever that is. And stick to it because you sat down before the emotion and everything of the sale and said, this is what that animal is worth to my operation. This is where he has to be or less before I can afford to buy him with my goals. And so stick to that, you know. Um, we see that a lot. It's okay to go home with an empty trailer. I mean, it really is, or it's okay not to buy anything. Because that means that, like we said, you set goals and you stuck to them, and that's perfectly fine. You know, um, I know most of the guys that, that host these sales would say, everybody should go home with a full trailer, right? I mean, that's the way it should be. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, if you're being calculated about your decisions, sometimes you'll leave and not have purchased anything. And that's fine. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of the in-person things to remember when we go to an auction. Um, what are what are some things to remember if we're if we're doing this online uh, or or over the phone? Uh, let's talk about online first. Mm -hmm. um, for for someone like us, uh, our internet service isn't very good, and sometimes it it can fade in or out, or maybe it shuts off on its own. Right. And that's the worst case scenario you could have is when your lot comes in and your internet goes black. Right. Um, so making sure you have stable internet uh, is rule number one. Making sure uh, that you have done everything on that website to register yourself as a bidder. And a lot of them will have a click box where you click for accepting terms and conditions of those sales. Make sure you click that. 
and then your, your bid button will show up after that happens. But the thing that you need to understand about bidding online versus in person. When you set in a sale and you bid in person, you're immediately in the sale, right? right. Your bid is immediately taken to the auctioneer. There is sometimes is a time and audio delay on online stuff. So for example, let's just say you and an individual both, let's say an individual online bids at the same time that you bid live. Your bid live will be t heard and taken by the auctioneer prior to the one on the internet a lot of the time. Right. So you have to understand that online, um, you have to bid quickly online um, and it's still you still not may not be in the real time of the auction and we'll you'll see a lot of auctioneers do this and it's the only fair way to do it is as they're nearing the end of the auction for that particular lot they'll give time in their chant for um, someone online to follow up with a bid before they drop the hammer and say sold and it's the it's the fairest way for people online to bid that way uh, but a lot of times those people in the seat actually have the advantage over the internet due to time and audio delays or video and audio delays online. All right, Evan, so we have been successful. We've won the bid on the animal that we want to purchase. And so walk us through the process of checkout and what we need to do next. So the first thing you'll do is as you're set, sitting in the stands, and the ring man comes to you and says, I need your bidder number. You're gonna let him know what it is, show him the card, whatever the case may be. Make sure that they call out that number correctly so that that animal is charged to you. And what'll happen a lot of times is um, they will check out and do everything at the completion of the auction. So if you bought the first animal in the ring, you may be waiting a little while to check out. Um, but you'll go back to the same table where you got your bidder number, the same office, whatever the case may be. Uh, you'll write checks to the appropriate people there. A lot of times if you're standing in line, you'll see a sign that says, go ahead and make your checks out to such and such sale management or whatever the case may be. Um, you can go ahead and get that filled out. Obviously, you know what you paid, right? Sure. Double check that with the clerk when you get when you get there and make sure everybody's on the same page okay um, sometimes in the motion of the sale you may have bid another hundred or two hundred dollars and not really realized it okay uh, so make sure that everybody's on the same page once you've paid you should get a paid receipt you should get health papers that we talked about that help you transport that um, and then you can kind of proceed to if you're hauling your own cattle you can go get your truck and get in line and they'll tell you where to load out you know, site things, but most always you will not be able to load out cattle until the actual sale is complete. Yeah, so it's important to talk with that clerk and to make sure that you're on the same page, that you get that check written. Um, and then once you, and it's it, if you are not hauling your own animal home, uh, making sure that that animal gets to the proper truck and trailer, to the hauler that you're bringing home, and then how long is that process to get home? Yeah, let's just say you've already, uh, contracted someone to haul your bull for you. Uh, you need to tell that clerk who that is and they will keep a copy of the health papers and a copy of their seat there for them with their name on it to, to accompany that animal as, it, as it's transported. Uh, but they have to be made aware of that. Um, that way when it, everyone leaves that night, they know where to send cattle, you know, or who to put them with. Um, so that's a good piece of information to leave them. Yeah. As, as you can tell, there's a lot going on at the end of a sale and there's a lot of things happening. So just making sure that all of that gets with that animal. Okay, so we do have, you know, they get home. It's important to talk about a little bit of health since we have those health papers. Sure. When we get that animal on farm, um, is it important to quarantine them for a certain period of time? And if so, what, how many days? What is the process of that? It's always important to quarantine new animals into the herd, right? Uh, we will have a good understanding of the health protocol, especially on bulls. Uh, a lot of times at bull sales, those health protocols will be published in the front of the catalog. Um, and they'll, some of them are even backed by warranties and guarantees. Uh, you need to understand those as well. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Quarantining those cattle, 
uh, for whatever you and your veterinarian decide is appropriate um, is, is, a, is a must. Um, and, and actually just acclimating them to that environment I think is real appropriate at the time to make sure it's a successful transition. Thank you for watching our videos. This has been considerations for sale buying uh, at a livestock auction. If you have more questions or have, uh, would like more information, you can always reach out to your local cooperative extension service and they can help you with more, uh, more information. Oh,